Thanks everyone. Uh, maybe first thing, if you don't hear me or if you don't understand me, please raise your hand and I'll, I'll make sure you get what I, I say. Uh, I'll be speaking on a lot about EU institutions and EU policy making, so again, if there's something you don't understand, please stop me. When you work in the, what we call the EU bubble, then you think that everybody understands you, but it's actually not the case. Um, so yeah, my name is Laura Bihika. Uh, I started working in, well, I moved to Brussels 10 years ago. Let me to give you a bit of a background. I know that sometimes when you study, you always wonder how do people get their jobs. So um, I actually studied in the, the UK, EU politics. I moved to Brussels uh, to actually work on the environment with the trade union movement. And I got involved as an activist on the, on the fight against trade, the trade agreement between the EU and the US which got me into a lobby watchdog in Brussels. And now I'm still working on lobbying, but from, uh, from Paris, from an NGO called Observatoire des Multinationales. Uh, so what I do mostly is I research how corporations try to influence EU policy making. So this hasn't changed for the past uh, 10 years, I have to say. But I've done it in different ways. But this we can we take it to later on. Uh, well, I'm going to try, well, maybe, yeah, first thing to give you a bit of a pic picture, what is lobbying? So that we all get. Lobbying is trying to influence um, policy making. So you represent an interest, it can be a public interest or a private interest, commercial interest, and you try to make sure the legislation goes in your interest. It's not corruption. Corruption is when you're actually convinced by giving money. A lobby is convinced by giving arguments and expertise, so it's a, it's a different thing. Um, in, so I would say in Brussels, obviously I mean the EU uh, institutions, in the EU quarter, you have private companies that do try to influence. I'll be mostly focusing on those private companies and how they try to influence, but obviously uh, public authorities, consumer organizations, trade unions, NGOs, they, also, they are also lobbyists. We tend to differentiate in English, we say lobbyist for companies and usually we say, uh, we say they do advocacy for trade unions or NGOs and others, but at the, at the end of the day, we both are all trying to influence. Public authorities, it's a specificity in Brussels. You have the government of Catalonia, for instance, they have a big office next to the commission. Why? Well, first for political reasons, when you have a, a vote of independence, Obviously, they are talking with the EU institutions and also for money. You have lots of regional funds that are given by the institutions. So you have a lot of regions that have people in Brussels who know what kind of funds are coming up and when do we have to submit, what kind of uh, things we'll get from them. So you also have our public authorities. This figure that I'm giving you here is the amount of lobbyists and it's an estimate. I'm not able to tell you how many lobbyists, how many people try to influence EU legislation. If I was in Washington, I could give you a more, much more precise number than in Brussels. With it, the estimate of 37,000, those are people that often meet the decision maker, but in terms of like 24 hours, seven days, uh, well, I hope it's not 24 hours, but at least five days, <laughs> Uh, we, uh, week, we're talking about 6,000, so those are really people that do this, it's their only jobs. But you have a lot of people that will work, for instance, a toxicologist will be working for a chemical company, maybe, well, not, more, uh, not anymore from London, but from maybe Berlin or Den Haag or Paris, and they might come twice a week or twice a month to the EU institution. So those are lobbyists, but they also do other things. So to give you a bit of a picture. What I'm going to try and show you is give you a concrete example of how it works and always go back to what it means for democracy. And maybe the first thing that you need to think of is that the EU is a particular setting in terms of policy making. First, there was a research by Sylvain Laurent. He's a sociologist here in Paris, in UHSS, actually here in this building. And um, he has been looking in the archive of the commission. And what he found is interesting because it also gives you an idea of why corporations and institutions can have such a close relationship. You have to think that when the, at that time it was the high authority started, when you had the small European community, six member states, one of the first things that the people in the high authority had to do was to negotiate trade deals. 
So he had a new institutions with new negotiators. They were going to Geneva and they had to decide whether or not they would tax olives, olives with or without anchovies, olives black or green, and things like this. So they needed to know if we produced enough or not enough olives. Same thing for orange juice and things like this. And those people would be calling the capitals to have uh, to ask information. They would be calling Roma administration and say, how about olives? Do we import them? Do we need more or less? Or do we uh, stop from imports by putting taxes and things like this? And those people didn't answer. Why? Because at the time, you're a national civil servant. If you try giving information to Brussels, you know you're going to lose power. You're going to lose authority and power. So you're not going to tell them anything about the olive market in Italy. So what could the, the commission do? They went to the olive producers of Italy, of Belgium, of France, or of West uh, Germany, and they said, guys, please come together, do one European association, and help us, give us information about how, what kind of taxes do we do for imports? How do we protect or not the European market? And so some of the lobbies were actually pushed by the commission itself that asked for information. And it became, at that time, a win-win relationship. Why? Because the commission was getting information. So the commission, when they were going, they were doing, going to the trade negotiations, they were relevant, right? They were doing a good job. So they were gaining authority, and they were gaining, gaining trust. And obviously, the corporations, the lobbies, they were giving out the information for in their interest to the commission, and they were getting what they wanted from the trade negotiations. So both sides had an interest in working together. And this, because it was there from the beginning, does leave an, a, a trace in the way corporations and institutions work together. You also have to think that it's a very, usually, pretty slow process in EU policy making. You start with the Commission, they draft the legislation, and then you have the Council and the Parliament that amend it. The Council is 26 member states with 26 different governments, different political parties, different commercial interests, lots of different things. And the Parliament, again, very different political parties. And so usually because it's slow, the Commission has an interest, an incentive, let's say not an interest, an incentive to make sure that what they write as a draft law will not be blocked in the Council. And how do you make sure that it's not blocked? You actually look at what corporate organizations want. Because if you go too much against business interests, you might actually get a lot, a lot of conflict in the Council, or even the legislation might be put on the side and this is not what you do. Those are people writing legislation. They have a career. They want their draft, their draft to go through fast, efficiently, and get promoted, right? There's also sometimes uh, internal things that need to take into consideration. A lot of the time, I'm gonna to talk to you about the lack of council powers at the EU level. And one thing, for instance, about this is the opacity. So, <coughs> I'll give you a French example, but, uh, for a while, there was a French president that say, my enemy is finance. <laughs> and, uh, and whatever that French president said in Brussels when they were deciding on financial policy will never be known, right? The European Council, as well as the Council of Ministers, where member states go and decide, is never very transparent. What you know is the conclusions. You know the Council decided that nuclear is a green energy. What you didn't know is how France died uh, did an agreement with the Czech Republic so that the Czech Republic said yes to nuclear and France said yes to gas and they, you know, negotiated between themselves. This you'll never know. You only get the conclusions. So what it means is that national parliaments cannot control what the governments said in the council and they don't know the kind of diplomacy that has been there. So national parliaments have a very hard time having, you know, making the council accountant. And citizens can't neither. A prime minister after a council can come to the press and say, yeah, I tried my best uh, in order to make sure that we spend much more money on the green transition. Yeah, maybe, but who can prove it? No one. And so also, it's, the opacity also has an impact on democracy because it means that there's much less check and balance. I said most national parliaments, because actually there's one parliament in Europe where MPs, know exactly what happens in the council because they have access to a confidential database and it's Germany. 
Um, so yeah, the life of counterparts, we'll come to it again. The fact also that you have mostly a culture of technocracy, so you have technocrats, experts that write legislation. Again, they're not really up for debate, they don't really have, want to have opposition because it's going to slow the process and because it's not in their culture. Lack of expertise sometimes means that you depend on the expertise that come from corporations in order to write your legislation. And if you don't have the expertise, you think you can get it from the corporation and that it has no interest behind. So this whole idea of where you get your information from when you have to write the legislation. And again, sometimes you have to think about ideology also. Some decision makers will go and rely on business information because they believe that the market is the best for policy making, but this is another thing. So I'll try to go back and forth into those concepts while giving you examples. So what I said when I told you we don't know exactly how many lobbyists there are, so we have a transparency register. So that's this. In the register, organization put down their clients, number of staff, and also their budget. Uh, registrants, you have 12,000 people, but if you go, for instance, there's a law firm that's called Sidley Austin. When you go, it's a very big law firm. They have a former U.S. ambassador as their lobbyist, so heavy, heavy weight. Uh, and when you look at their website, they say that they help governments, uh, companies, and trade associations to navigate and shape EU rules. So they're a lobby firm, right? Sidley Austin is not in the transparency register. They would be in the US because it is compulsory. So there's a lot of organizations that we don't know about. And the only time when you actually do have to register vote is when you meet commissioners and members of the cabinet. So commissioner, there's 26 of them and they have portfolios and are the highest level in the commission. If you meet them or members of the cabinet, you would have to be registered. Do you have any idea which organization has the most accreditation to the European Parliament? Can you rephrase the question, please? So which kind of uh, lobbying organization has the most pass? I'm giving you this because it's the only official data that we have. So. You can have a pass to go in and out of the <coughs> European Parliament. Which organization has the most? Yeah. The Farmers Association, maybe? Farmers? Pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical? Automotive. Automotive? <coughs> to be honest, uh, I have to say it's a bit of a trap. So here are the accreditation. This is data from the European Parliament. This is an aggregate aggregator by Transparency International, but it, it comes from the European Parliament data. <coughs> so in the number of passes to the European Parliament, Actually, no, you don't have the farmers. Someone said farmer? Yeah. Well, it's actually chemicals here. The thing is, you probably don't know them, right? <laughs> and those are mostly public affairs organizations. I call them lobby mercenaries. <laughs> uh, you pay them to do lobbying for you. Um, but it's a bit too negative, but you, you get the point, right? Those are people um, that one week can work for Greenpeace on car emissions vehicles and the next week work for diesel, for Volkswagen, sorry. Um, they are usually uh, specialists, so they're usually expert people that know really well their field, but they are subcontracted. So to give you an idea, Fleshman Hillen works for most of the major EU and US banks. <coughs> um, BlackRock, JP Morgan, HSBC, Barclays, Societe uh, Générale and others, they, uh, they give money to flash money uh, uh, every year. Apple Worldwide is working for Digital Europe, Microsoft and others. This is a communication agency. <laughs> this is what they call public relations. So yeah, lobbying for Ruth Patterson, the same thing, lobbying. European, that's an NGO, European Environmental Bureau. FIPRA is also a, a lot of, uh, of digital and competition. FIPRA has one of the best competition lawyers you can think of. So the lawyers, when there's a merger, they'll make sure that you can merge, but you won't get uh, problems with the commission. BCW is a law firm 
Bertolt's Interrail, this is the communication agency of Coca-Cola, for instance, but also BP and Shell, they use those services. Consumer organization, um, Chemical Industry Council is all the chemical industry companies, the chemical companies that operate in Europe. So although you have Europe here, that doesn't mean you have only European companies. It's all the chemical companies that sell and produce in Europe. And if, for example, like Coca-Cola or BP like contracts these firms, like do we know like what proportion they only like trust these people to defend their interests, or do they have additional lobbyists? And like, do we have some kind of idea like what's the relation between the two? So the only thing we know, so if we look at Danton, uh, is how much they spend per year. Um, so. We know that yet. So that's 73 people in this case of Danton. They still have, maybe now they don't have Coca Cola. When I tell you, up. Oh. <laughs> now BP they have here, they, so that's the only thing we know. The amount and the kind of uh, legislation they work on. That's the only thing we know. And it's the same for everything. Ah, yeah, Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola is this amount, and it's on the EU farm to fork, so it's on, um, on farming regulation and pesticides. Um, that's, yeah. Again, uh, you can have governments. So one that is very famous is uh, Hill and Norton. Hill and Norton is a very old uh, public relation organization. Jonathan Hill. Jonathan Hill used to be a journalist, and he was one of the first person in the 50s in the US to actually open a public relations firm at the same time as Edward Byrne. Baines, I mean, uh, so it's yeah, the grandfathers of public relations. Um, and Hill and Norton here in this case, they work for foreign governments, the Ministry of Financial Services of the Cayman Islands, obviously on taxation. <laughs> oh. Uh, I'll show you this also because with the Qatar gate, so when there was a corruption scandal in the parliament, um, they kind of forgot that uh, foreign governments don't only influence with uh, millions of cash, they can also hire public relations firms that do the lobbying for them, and in this case, that's what you do here. This, in Washington, I would have the contract. I would know exactly the kind of services. Because in Washington, this is as, um, considered as foreign interference, and it's a free plan, it's a uh, US act against foreign uh, interference, where you will actually get the contract. So here in Norton, for instance, has worked for the United Arab Emirates in the US to kind of greenwash the image because they're gonna host a COP soon. And this contract is publicly available. The United Arab Emirates now work with APCO and we don't have a so again, you know, we often think that we do things better in the EU than in the US, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not always the case. Well, it's not always comparable neither because the systems are very different. I answer your other question. More or less. Or uh, you want to see, maybe we can, do you want to see for, for BP maybe? I was just wondering whether they have their own like lobbyists. That was the they do have their own lobbyists yeah. also. So um, actually the best example for this is Google. Because Google is, is, this is what I call the, the eco chamber or the bubble effect. You have your own lobbyists, and then you have a lot of subcontractors and a lot of organization that you're a member of. And why is it important? It's important because your own lobbyists, they monitor. They look at everything that's going on. The kind of legislation that have an impact on Google, the kind of impact, and whether the legislation is likely to happen or not. And with your own lobbyists, you know where you are trying to influence. And with your subcontractors and the others, that's when you have to fight. When things don't go your way, it's really when you can actually activate all those levers. And so Google has 30 people. And they spend <coughs> 5.5 million 
on the floor. The 5.5 don't go to the 30 people. <laughs> You're well paid when you Google lobbyists because one of them is actually the wife of a friend. But uh, she doesn't get that, that amount divided by 30. Um, this is because Google, they have the 30 people, the 30 staff with those EP passes. So that those are people that come and go in and outside of European Parliament as they wish. But Google has all those companies that are working for them. Uh, FTI Consulting was the first on the list I showed you before. Yeah. Fab, I know those one here. Those are mostly communications and public relations. Well, there's no law from here, yeah, public and So they and they are a member of a lot of organization that can actually, you know, help them, uh, uh, yeah, get the message across, let's say. So Business Europe, obviously, Digital Europe, but also all those kind in European Internet Forum. But sometimes they've been criticized because, for instance, they are a member of Highlight for Startups, and they're not really a startup. <laughs> and although last year there was a digital, European digital law, and some members of the European Parliament complained because they say, well, you can't be named Allied for Startups when you have Google or Meta behind it. Um, and yeah, I, I've seen that there were two hands. I'm just finishing this and then I'll. And one thing that also raises question is, this probably doesn't mean anything to you, the Wilfred Martin Center for European Studies, but this is the think tank of the European People's Party, so the right-wing group of the European Parliament. So the Republicain in France, or CDU in Germany, or other big uh, conservative parties, the think tank in the European Parliament gets money from Google. And now that's what I'm saying. It's not always black and white. I'm not saying that Google gave them money and they said what Google wanted to say. But if one day, you know, they start writing something that is too much against Google interest, they might think twice before they actually write it or publish it. Right? And they also sponsor two big um, newspapers, Euractive and Political. There were two hands yes. uh, Just a small clarification to make sure I understand this properly. Uh, when we say, for example, in the specific case of Google, that they have 30 people with accreditations to have free entry and exit into the parliament, mm -hmm. that means that those are the 30 people on a Google card, but there are more people looking after Google's interests at a lo level lower than just having a accredited card mm -hmm. so even though they spend 5.5 million euros uh, that's on the entire spectrum of people working for Google but they have 30 people off Google overlooking the whole thing inside the European Parliament uh, no so they have 30 maybe sorry if I wasn't here they have 30 people working in their offices Google offices uh, in Brussels next to the European Parliament out of those 30 staff, all of them here have a pass to the European Parliament. Okay. And the 5.5 million is the expenditure of Google in lobbying in general, so staff, but also membership of organization and the lobbying firms, the communication right. firms and the law firms. So maybe to give you an example, so they're not working with APCO anymore, um, but it's, it's, I was trying to give you the, show you the case study online, but uh, they've taken it away. Um, APCO, for instance, they worked for Digital Europe, so not Google, but Digital Europe. And APCO, they were called by Digital Europe because two weeks before a vote in the Council of Ministers, those people here, people working for Google, but for Meta and in digital Europe, they were trying to influence the ministers, but they didn't manage to get their interest through. So they called APCO because APCO is a communication agency. And APCO did a lot of communication work to help them. So they got opinion pieces in the Financial Times, good press coverage in Euractive and things like this. So the core, the strategy, the monitoring, it's those people inside Google. But they also have other people here, external. So there's someone in CRAB that is probably um, knows everything about advertising online. Or there is someone in FTI Consulting that knows everything about taxation. Those people, they work for Google. They look at 
how those policies have an impact on our Google, but they don't work for Google. They are contracted by Google to follow a policy or sometimes to help them when Google doesn't get its interest through on its own and it needs external help. And, uh, just, uh, just out of curiosity, do we know like what European Union associations or council lobbies like also have influence and are also like is this in the data like which are associations are also influencing other countries outside the European Union? You know? So how foreign governments try to influence EU? No, like no. the other way around. How, how the EU tries to influence foreign governments or foreign governments? No, we have the, no, that's complicated because it will be both the European Union external services mm -hmm. that have offices across the world, but you still have <coughs> national member states that also um, have influence. So, no, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. How reliable is this five million number? Is it reported by Google? That's the thing. The only thing that is, uh, uh, I'm not really trying to, yeah. The only thing that is not from Google is this. This is imported from the database of the Parliament. That's why I asked you about <laughs> European Parliament access at my first question, because this is official. The rest is Google that self reports. So one of my favorite things is to do complaints to the transparency register, because a lot of the time you have a you have data that is not compatible, so let me check if this one has been changed. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to show you one that has been changed. But five days ago, it wasn't changed. Sorry, I'm on, a, I'm on my hotspot, so it's a bit slow. Um, so last week, I looked again at Philip Morris. Oh, well, anyway, Philip Morris had seven staff and eight European packs. So there is a lot of, there is a lot, of, well, I don't know actually, there, is, there are cases of under-reporting. But the problem, and again this also comes from the structure of the EU, is that you can get away with under-reporting. Again, I'm not saying that all the bees should go to jail, but in the US, <laughs> if I was under-reporting, I would go to jail. Like, with the UK, there was a whole scandal with Ukraine, and some lobbies that were working for the Ukrainian government five years ago uh, actually went to jail because they were not reporting. Here in, in, in the EU, you don't have an EU administrative court where, for instance, here, I'm not able to go to see a lawyer, go to the EU administrative court and say, hang on a minute, Philip Morris under-reported, please bring them all to jail. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it's not that I won't, it's just that there's, so here they say they only have eight, nine, ten, exactly eleven. So there are there are eleven passes to the European Parliament, and according to them, they have ten people only doing three full-time equivalent. And there's been also a case where I'll show you the figures because I don't I'm not really good with remembering numbers. Uh, there was a case where. Anyway, the, there's a case where Fleshman Hibbert was working for Monsanto. They were listing all the people that were against glyphosate. Glyphosate is an herbicide. And Fleshman Hibbert worked for Monsanto for 14 million euro to do a blacklist for a year everywhere across the EU. They were found guilty in the French courts. So the contract was published. And uh, Fleshman Hill had reported uh, 400,000. That they worked for 400,000 for Monsanto. That's what they said in the transparency register when it was 14 million. And this is public knowledge. This is a public document. But again, there's nothing you can do. So it doesn't you know, provide for, when you know there are no sanctions, you don't, you know, it's, it's a different kind of reporting. And you're less, in, there's, there are less incentives to report the curate. So I showed you like 
efficient lobbying is quite efficient when you're discreet, you know. I'm sure that Sidley Austin can tell the clients, come and work for me, nobody will know. One thing that works really well is what I've just shown you, is that you get one company that get, does the same message for different channels. And he raises really about the idea of, that, that the question that he raised with democracy. So for instance, Google that I've just shown you. Google, last year, there was a, you, the Digital Market Act, the DMA as we say in, in the bottle. It was portrayed as a law in order to leave space for EU tech companies. So try to reduce the influence of the big tech for EU European startups to grow in the European market. If you frame it this way, obviously you're going to have a lot of support, right? And Google tried to change the narrative into, hang on a minute, we the big tech provide you free quality services. So if you start regulating us too much, you're actually going to harm European consumers. And they have different narratives, you know? And in this, Google, actually Google lobbying strategy was leaked. And you can see that in the strategy, there were two things that were interesting. Was change the narrative. So talk about how Google innovates, gives you free quality services, and make sure that you activate the eco chamber through think tanks, academics, and the organization you sponsor. And this eco chamber is basically, you are Google, and you make sure that APCO writes, or gets journalists to write in this sense that, come on, Google is giving you more free quality services. You make sure that you get this message across in events. Maybe you're going to get a study somewhere. And you'll have your own lobbyists and other lobbyists trying to go and meet decision makers. So if you are a member of the European Parliament, for instance, you have someone from iLight for Startups that tells you, oh, you know, it's not such a great idea that you regulate, leave the market alone. You go to an event where they tell you, don't forget that big tanks actually give you really good services. You read a newspaper article that reminds you that Google actually provides great services, and on and on and on. And you end up only hearing the same message. But you think it comes from different people. And it's the same thing as if your sister, your grandma, or your best friend tells you there's a new ice cream and it's great. You're going to say, well, if everybody says it, it must be true. Same technique. If everybody says it, it must be true. The only problem is it's not everybody. It's one company using different channels to get the same message across. And that's where it really raises a question about democracy. How much space does it leave to different voices? And those different voices, do they have the means to actually get the space and get the same, you know, different actors? Just a question on clarifying what echo chamber here means. Um, do we mean the allied organizations that let's say Google is supporting or is part of, uh, which become kind of like the channels through which exactly. uh, Google is reaching out to multiple levels of policy makers and people working on legislation? Exactly, yeah. Exactly. And this, those echo chamber, obviously, uh, it is the main job. So again, sorry, Google. So the organization that Google pays like a uh, like crab or others, those obviously they are, their job is to be an eco chamber. It's a bit more subtle with uh, political or the European Youth Forum or others, you know. They want, they're not there to be in an eco chamber. So those will be full supporters, right? They will be the one that go and meet policy makers. They will be the one to get your journalists right in a certain way. They will organize events that gives you a certain portrait of the legislation. Obviously, those, it's not so direct. Obviously, those, this Europe, yes, and digital Europe, place. it's a bit more subtle if you think about Google or if you think about think tanks, right? Um, let me give you an example about this spinning, because I've just talked about spinning. So I'm not saying that Google is lying, right? Google is providing free quality services to most of us. This is not, uh, I'm not questioning this. What I'm question, question, questioning, oh, they've changed it. Mm -hmm. Ah, no, they still go to like, so they just changed the title. Um, 
what I'm questioning is when you only have one side of the picture that takes the entire space, right? And this is what we call spinning in English with uh, the spin, right? You have one political problem and you are shown one side of the problem and it can actually hide other sides which have full legitimacy to be heard also, right? Let me give you an example. So this used to be called prevent another financial crisis. And we are at the time of the greed crisis. The European Central Bank is sending money to a greed bank. But before that, it wants to audit the bank. Obviously, that bank doesn't want to get audited, so they call Arben Geiger and they say, please make sure we don't get audited. Arben and Geiger spins it in a very clever way. What they did is they went to see people in Frankfurt, obviously, ECB, Brussels, Berlin, and they told policymakers, if you audit that bank, you're going to give a message to the markets that the bank is not stable. If you give that message to the markets, they'll keep speculating against Greece. If they keep speculating against Greece, you'll keep having a worse financial crisis. So you shouldn't do that audit. So they prevented another financial crisis. They helped prevent another wave of economic instability in Greece, largest systemic bank. After six months. That's one side of the picture. The other side of the picture is the European taxpayers giving money to a great bank and maybe wanting to be sure that they know where that money will go and whether it will really help or not the Greek people, right? But by giving by having this you know influence machine, you actually they manage to get what they want in six months by being the only message in town. So you see, that's how spinning can actually have an impact on democracy, when it takes the entire political space and debate. Uh, what would happen if these people did not visit Berlin or so? What would happen to this bank? It would have been audited, and then they would have received the money, I guess, or, or, or the budget would have been really bad, maybe not. Um. Um, lobbying um, is usually done by, I would say, two kind of experts, right? Uh, political experts, so people that know really well how the institutions work, know who exactly has power in the commission and when. Basically, they know who to call when, right? And it's really important for you, you know? And technical experts, really, really high-level toxicologists for Bayer and BASF, for instance, or for others. So again, I'm not saying that those people are stupid. They are usually very high-level experts. <laughs> if you look at some of the job announcements for BASF or Bayer or the pesticide lobby in the, in the EU, you'll find that they usually have high-level toxicologists with a PhD and so on. Political experts, for instance, the former Swedish prime minister, who's also the head of the <coughs> European Socialist Party, he works for Ruth Peterson, a communication agency one of the biggest ones is here in the top level, in the final. So this person is here basically because the clients saw Ruth Peterson, if they know that the socialists in the European Parliament are changing their mind, or they don't really know what to vote on a new legislation, well, they can call Ruth Peterson, who can call Stefan, who can tell them, yeah, on that file, call the socialist. Is the socialist that all the socialists follow? or trust. And that's super valuable knowledge. Uh, it, it is worse than corruption. No? <laughs> there's, no, like, there's no exchange of money here. Uh, at worst. <laughs> Isn't it it's like... Without money included. Probably it is included in your money. And the thing is, that's what I will come to after, is that is it those people, Ruth Peterson, they have a business plan that is to influence. They sell the influence. <coughs> he knows this and he went to work for them, right? He's allowed to do this while being New York Socialist Party. And we have the other side. Someone in the European Parliament is going to get a call from Stefan and might not know that he works for a good person, or knows and doesn't mind, or gets influence. So there's a lot of things. It's not just about them. It's also about the people receiving the message. They let themselves be convinced. 
Yeah? So it's not, I wouldn't say it's corruption, I would say the responsibility is really diffused. It's the institutions for the lack of transparency and letting those things happen. It's the former politicians for, you know, changing interests without, or having two <coughs> conflicting interests. But it's also the decision makers for letting themselves be. So you can never really, you know, tell it that black and white. There is no law that can you could prevent someone from a party to join a consult uh, consulting firm. Yeah? You could have what's called a cooling off period. So if you've been prime minister, you're not allowed to go to a public relations firm for <coughs> six months, a year, a year and a half. Just from a clarification, because I know very little about the European Union. Yeah, it's fine. Right. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering what the. Um, I mean, so this is one uh, parallel sort of um, chain of incidents, right? Because there's so much uh, legal exchange of information which is very sensitive or which is very valuable in uh, changing outcomes mm -hmm. for legislation. And arguably, <coughs> I mean, it is very much detrimental to how uh, democracy would function or how much space would have for everyone to have a voice on a platform like the European Parliament. But I'm not sure what exists in the background in terms of exchange of privileged information, because I know that, uh, for example, in the United States, um, privileged information is very protected. And like, for example, if we go back to the Greece example uh, with the consulting firm that they hired to avoid the audit, um, if, for example, such a firm would show up at the European Central Bank saying, hey, we have a pitch for you, you should, you should probably listen to us. Uh, I think like a background check of that firm and who who they made deals with, do are they you know hand in glove with the Greek bank? Is the Greek bank actually trying to avoid something with us? Those are obvious questions which if I am asking as a you know as a nobody as a as a master student, people sitting in the European Parliament are way more qualified and way smarter to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. So what I wonder right now is what is the existing state of of exchange of privileged information, what is the state of, state of perjuring yourself, for example, um, or, or how, how does it work? Because like, that's like a very valid thing to connect here. Well, um, as a person in the ECB or the German government or the new institution, you can, all, you can always Google Alba and Geiger and know who they work for. Oh, uh, Google, I mean, put in the transparency register. For instance, at the moment, they work for the government of India on the EU-India trade negotiations. <laughs> Amazing. But it's nothing like, um, that's quite interesting because I also happen to work on trade and they, Harbour and Gega called me one day and they said, we're working for the government of India on the EU tra India trade negotiation. You've been writing something against that deal, so obviously they wanted to talk to me. Embassy of India, EU-India free trade agreements. And EU Russia sanctions. <laughs> so I mean, at the ECB, when I receive Alba and Geiger, I can I can see who they work for. There's no limit on the kind of information that can be exchanged. Supposedly, legally, they should come up and Geiger and say, "I come as a representative of uh, that Greek bank." And the person in the ECB or the decision makers can have a look in the transparency register and check who they're talking on behalf of. But the kind of information that is exchanged is not limited. No, there's not. I know that in the US they have this legal background, but it's not the case in the EU. So Again, it's because there's, sorry, it's, there's no like, the EU has competency in policy making, but it's not in itself a government with full administrative and, and, and legal powers. You know, it's a bit of a hybrid where even if they wanted to have this, there's no legal background we have. You will have to change the treaty. See what I mean? Just to yeah. follow up to that, for example. Um, so if, if I look at, for example, another question that came to my mind when I look at the list of you know, people's names from Google is, is the privacy concerns, which, which are very strong, um, to have like names displayed, their ID card numbers displayed, which is, again, sensitive information. Um, I suggest maybe that we keep part of the questions for the debate. Okay, sorry. Also I'm also discussing. Okay, sorry. Okay. After, I'll keep it up. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sorry. And there was one more? Okay, okay. 
Okay, I'll keep going. It's true that I don't see the time. Oh, it's 50. Okay, I didn't see the time. Okay. Yeah, I'll go. Um, yeah, one thing that we say a lot in lobbying is if you come the earlier, the better. And that also is important because a lot of the time you would think that uh, it's all about money. The fact that uh, Google has so much money is the reason why it is so important. It's not, that link is not always true. What's also very important is if you come early in the debate, you actually frame the political question that the law is going to answer. And when that framing is there, it's very hard to change it. Let me give you an example. Back in the days, <laughs> when, I went to, when I was in your place and I was a, a student, uh, there was a big debate in environmental economics on whether you do you tax pollution or you do an emission trading system. You have a carbon market. So companies are given a right to pollute. If they pollute more, they exchange it on the market. Or companies are given a right to pollute, and if they pollute more, you tax them. Right? There was a big debate about this. Uh, the EU has a carbon market that the first version didn't really work. The carbon price was too low, and it didn't really reduce emissions. So when they were renewing it, you would expect that there would be a debate about, well, it didn't work, should we do a tax, should we do something else, right? But the debate quickly went into, how do we improve the second version? But we keep a carbon trading system, right? And the debate was clearly, it changed, the second version is different, but it's not a big change from the first one. And it's not having such efficiency until now. And why? Because if you're Business Europe or the International Emission Trading Association and you come very early on, you're quickly going to say, yes, I know, let's do it this way this time. And so you get policymakers to improve the existing model. If you're a Greenpeace and you come before them and you say, hang on a minute, why don't we tax and we use that money in order to pay for renewables or in order to reduce whatever the, the price of uh, energy of, or heating for poor families, whatever, you know? There the question is, ah, okay, do we keep the system or do we put a tax? If you hear the beginning of the debate, then you have two different debates. And once you have a draft out, once you have a new version of the ETS, or you have a tax, if, if you come after this, it's too late. So typically, Greenpeace came when the second version of the trading system was out, and they went and said, no, it's not a good idea, let's do a tax. They're too late. No member state is going to say, the Commission, go back and redo your draft. And members of the European Parliament are going to say, well, okay, I'm going to oppose what we have now, but I can't write a new legislation to have a tax, right? So really being here at the beginning of the debate really frames the, group, the, the debate. And once that framing is there, it's very difficult to change. So being in early is also very important. Okay, a lot of those I've told you but yeah, companies do lobby, but they also go for trade association, right? When we looked at the biggest lobbyists, you have mostly trade association. Most of the time we think it's companies, but here, that's a trade association, a trade association. You're stronger if you have all the companies of Europe speaking with one voice, all the chemical industry speaking with one voice, than if you have buyer going, and then Dupont, and then Zinzin, or whatever. Same thing with Business Europe. You're stronger speaking with one voice, and if you have BP and then Uber and then Shell and then the biggest companies, no. If you come together to the institution with one voice, you get more power. So a lot of the lobbying happens for trade associations. Lawyers, I'm a former Belgian diplomat, I love that quote. Um, rules, I was talking about rules and pulling off period. That's a former trade commissioner. During the pandemic, he was found playing golf in Ireland without respecting quarantine. He had to resign. There's a, a year of cooling off period where he's not supposed to work for the lobbies or the corporations. So he created Hogan Services. <laughs> Hogan Services works for a law firm that's a lobbying firm and for Vodafone also. So again, you have the rules that have been changed. But the problem that hasn't changed is the culture. The culture that it's totally okay to do this. And why is it totally okay? Hogan does this in Ireland, I'm not sure he gets away with it. Hogan does this in Brussels, he gets away with it. And that's the whole question, because very few people are okay. 
So you have very few people that get scandalized, and not enough for it to become a big scandal. And that's the same thing when I was telling you about Philip Morris and showing you their under report. You get away with it. Because no, there's very few counterpowers. You, you, don't, you, you can't be scared of public opinion. And it's one thing that you have as an NGO that you don't have as a corporation. Again, it's public opinion. So yeah, maybe Greenpeace doesn't have much budget. Not as much as the biggest uh, chemical industry in the world. But when you had a big debate seven years ago about glyphosate, Greenpeace was very influential because Greenpeace had public opinion behind them. They had politicized the issue. And this is what I was telling you at the beginning. It's because you don't have politics, you don't have debate, you don't have controversy. <coughs> That's also why you have so much space for corporations to influence through the technical expertise, through the depoliticization of the debate. Public relations, I showed you. Here, Apcoda's communication. They've been working for the presidency of the Council for Croatia. Again, why is this legal? They, 2020, they work for a member state as the president of the council. But they also have their own corporate members. Which means that maybe I'm working for Croatia and in the APCO offices, and my neighbor might be working for Digital Europe. And my colleague one day might tell me, oh, hang on a minute, uh, my client has a problem with this. Do you know who manages this uh, on digital? And bam, bam, bam. And informally, without realizing, you get clients of APCO privileged access to the council. Here again we're moving those. Dominic Christo, he was the, the chief of DG Energy. So he's below the energy commissioner, but he doesn't have to do the whole press release, the meetings, blah, blah, blah. He, he can be on his own in the office of work. He left the uh, commission to work for Danton Global Advisors, the one that we've seen, that have DP as a client. So what they do a lot is what I was telling you, they do a lot of framing in public relations, like Alvar and Gaia. In this case, you see the kind of person that they've recruited. His name is Dan Sobovic. He used to be the speechwriter of the vice president, and he became senior advisor for digital communication of BCW. BCW. So they have the speech writer of the vice president of the commission. And this is really important in terms of, again, the spin. That person here in BCW can tell you what gets Sefcovic interest. Gas, hydrogen, or not. How you frame it to make sure that he listens. Kind of channels to get him, you know. Maybe that guy doesn't answer to WhatsApp and only emails or vice versa. And this might look like nothing, but it makes a whole difference if that person in BCW tells you which channel you get Sefcovic's attention. And this is what I was telling you, how they also provide intelligence. So Fleshman Hidden was doing that blacklist of opponents of glyphosate for Monsanto. And they do now what they call corporate activism, Fleshman Hidden. So I was on one of their, yeah, during COVID, the good thing about webinars were online, so I managed to <laughs> register. On Fleshman here, of course. <laughs> and they actually did a fake stone. So they were showing you how they did a fake patient organization, patients that had a rare disease, and they were paid to do a stunt, so a bit like Oxfam does, or you know, stunt you dress up. <laughs> and they were dressed up in front of the European Parliament as patients needed medicine. They were like, please give her a cure. Paid 10 euros per hour. And behind this, you actually had pharmaceutical company and I was trying to get money for research yeah. from the institution. They call this corporate activism. Yeah. And did they get the money? <coughs> I didn't even tell us because the, the client was confidential. Mm. This they know how to protect. This they know how to protect. <laughs> Obviously that's often what we think. We also ha often have this idea that it's a lot about cocktails and receptions and things like this. It's part of the picture, not only, but there is a lot of it that also happens during events. So here you have a FAMA, uh, Asset Management Association. They have an event 
three very important people. Um, they do a lot of those. They have a sponsorship package. So now it's not public anymore. I have printouts of uh, previous versions, but now they don't print it. They don't, it's not public. You have to send them an email. Uh, in, in other ones, or so not in this one, but I'm guessing it's the same thing. You pay different rates, and you pay 50,000 if you want to be a speaker <coughs> here. Here, see you. But you also, with 50,000, you're invited to the pre-conference dinner. And that informal mixing of public and private interests is part also of the job and has a lot of influence, although I'll, I'll never be able to tell you how much. The other one is this one. So this is Eurofi. It's the, yeah, they say it's a think tank, but it's more of an event organization. They have all the major banks in the world. And every six months, depending on the presidency <coughs> council, they have reception in the capitals. So this one is in Santiago de Compostela, for Spain is the president of uh, the council. They had one in Stockholm uh, in February. And um, this is a great mixing of, uh, of joy. You have public authorities, but you also have, you have central bankers, you have ministers, MEPs, you have Spanish political authorities, you have the members. So we give you an idea of the members. Dutch bank, you see, right? And again, they have an event where they probably share expert knowledge, and where MEPs are probably there because they will learn things that they don't know or they need to know. I'm not questioning the fact that you need information from those corporations, especially in finance, where sometimes they have more information than you get access to. What I'm questioning is the fact that MEPs, first, MEPs are invited, they get the three-star hotel and the business class, they get the dinners and stuff, so they get the nice image and nice, you know, and contacts in a very informal way, and second, not all MEPs actually report it. So if I want to get the, <coughs> I know it's a bit bad, but okay, if I want to get a detailed program of local fee, I go and look on the member page of a German MEP, and I'll get everything. The German MEP is going to show me his flight, his hotel, the program, and everything. If I go and see Stéphanie Jan Courta, the French MEP who was always there, because she used to be a, um, in a, a law firm and she works on finance, she never ever published any of those events. But I know she's there, she's in the list, I know she's been you know, offered to go there. So, first, it's a mixing of public private. <laughs> but also sometimes it's not transparent. So some of the people invited there don't actually report the fact that they've been nicely invited to this event. And the thing that I was, I'm gonna try and finish with a positive note. I'll try, sorry if I get to depress you. Um, so what I was saying you, right? The league strategy of Google, where you have this equal chamber. In think, in think tanks, you also have events where you get to know important people. So here, for instance, it's a bit old, but I think it's still important. In 2020, you had a new commission. Yeah. They just started, and the main thing of von der Leyen was the Green Deal, right? So you have a new commission, only three months there. Main thing is the Green Deal. And if you're members of Friends of Europe, only if you're members of Friends of Europe, you get to speak in an informal way with the Green Deal advisor of the President Commission. So three months after she started, you already are with one of the key persons in the Commission on the Green Deal. Again, in a more or less formal basis. So that's the thing. It's the early access, the high level access, that really makes a difference. But it doesn't always work. <laughs> I've been, I worked on the Uber and how Uber and other platform companies have been trying to influence the platform directive. So the law is trying to give or not workers' rights to Uber drivers, but also to courtiers and, and other kinds of jobs. The law is done by the Commissioner for Social Rights, and the Volt, Deliveroo, Delivery Hero, Hero, Uber and Volt, they came together and they did the Delivery Platforms Europe. And they commissioned the study because they realized that the commissioner was actually going more for social rights and workers' rights, right? And obviously they didn't want that. Their study was commissioned by the Copenhagen Economics Research. 
A study was so biased that inside the commission services, I got the, um, so I asked a lot of documents to the commission, and I got the briefing for the commissioner when they were going to meet Uber. And the services of the commissioner were saying, the independence and quality of this study raises questions. So again, it's not that black and white. The fact in this sense that they've given money to this institute, and they kind of, the research was so biased that it didn't work. So it's always a, um, a thin line that they work on and that they, 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 they know to work on really well. They spin, they don't lie. They do provide expertise. And when that expertise is too biased, it doesn't work. And it raises this question again that I was telling you, is on which kind of expertise do you base your decision making? You know? And if you like expertise, where do you get it from? <laughs> like, for instance, in the European Parliament, <laughs> the European Parliament, for instance, they know that, um, well, at first they're a most more political organization, right? Because the political parliament is made of different parties. But they know that sometimes they lack like expertise. And obviously, if you're a member of the European Parliament and you have to vote on the trade deal, and after this on financial services, and after this on digital market, you obviously don't know everything, right? And even if you have advisors for your political, political groups, you know, you might, you know, you, you need expertise. And in the parliament, what they did was they have a think tank that gathers expertise from all the sides. So they realize they like expertise. But when they do, they do, it's interesting if you ever need to work on an European file, it's called the European Parliamentary Research Services. Their mandate is to collect information from different sources, from different sources. So they will tell you, this is the legislation. This is what this think tank thinks. This is what companies think. This is what NGO thinks. This is, this is, and then you, as a decision maker, you make your own line. And I think that is where, also what I wanted to raise, the question I wanted to raise. Expertise is not always completely neutral. <coughs> when Greenpeace goes and talks about glyphosate, it takes some scientific studies. When Bayer talks about glyphosate, it takes other scientific studies, right? How do you make your own mind? How do you actually be, you know, not being technocratic, but being political? All right, they're all different interests. As a decision maker, you make your own mind about what you think is the public interest. And you don't just, you know, think about, oh, those are the experts, the ones that I've seen in Europe, they know about finance, and I'll just follow them, right? And this is what I was also trying to tell you. It's also the culture of the institutions that have to be changed, and the way the people that are writing legislation think about expertise and how to get information. And the very few counter powers is something maybe more um, specific to the EU, but I think it's really it's important to think about all those organizations that have shown you they have power again because there's not that strong counter powers, right? The national parliaments don't really look at what happens in Brussels. There's no European public opinion. There's no European media that you read or watch or listen to every morning. So typically in France, most people working in politics will listen to France Inter or they read Le Monde. You don't have this at the EU level. You don't read European media. You don't feel part of a European civil society. If you feel strongly to a trade union, it will be your national trade union. Same thing with your Greenpeace or whatever, or Bund in Germany. It's your but you physically, politically feel similar to a national organization, not a European one. But climate legislation is European, pesticide legislation is European, finance, trade, this is all European. If you ever want to get interested in EU politics, it's all in English, and you need quite a lot of expertise. The way it works is a real complex. I still don't understand comitology, <laughs> and why for gets approved by comitology, and I've been doing this for 10 years. And also, what really is important is think about them. The culture of the institution is that they are technocrats, 
and they're doing a good job by making, sometimes by only relying on, on corporate uh, expertise. And this is an article, I know it's in French, but it's from the Ombudsman. So I kept telling you about how there's no sanction and there's no justice. There's an Ombudsman. She cannot sanction institutions or lobbyists for not respecting the rules. She can only use public pressure. And she said after six years, and she's going to stop next year, that it's very hard to change the culture. And that's this, is, is the culture of policy making at the EU level that has a, has a lot of, that explains a lot of the power that corporations can have. And the whole thing is, well, how do you make EU issues sexy then? And whose responsibility is it? Is it the member of the European Parliament? If you, any of you is European, next year you're going to vote for the European elections. Do you know who your MEP is? Do you know what he does? Have you ever seen him or her? Probably not. So maybe it's their job to make the EU more sexy and closer to you. Or your national parliament. And also, how do you make sure that you ask for a better EU without actually being said, oh, are you anti-EU? I'm not anti-EU by showing you what I call the dark side. I'm just uh, actually trying to show you how we can improve it. But lately, if you criticize it, you, you're an NTU. And I always wonder why, and I am French, I'm not happy with my comp, nobody told me I am anti-French. <laughs> why I have to be NTU? And so how much space do we have to bring back the politics inside EU democracy? I think that's the main question behind corporate looking. Thank you, and thank you for... <laughs>
Um, but this, these files, uh, so they were uncovered by journalists, and they mainly uh, describe what happened between 2013 and, and 2017. So the report that we are discussing today, it's uh, published in October 22, so it's like right in between here. And it discusses what happened after uh, the European Commission uh, drafted the first uh, directive. Um, you would kind of say against all odds, uh, in June 2023, the, uh, the European Council actually adopted a position on the directive that was uh, written in, in 2021. Um, it's still not official law, but they're trying to finalize it. Uh, I think, if I understood it correctly, because it is really complicated, before the spring of 2024. So what is this law about? What is the, the discussion uh, that these platform companies try to influence? Um, basically, it involves a lot of technical details, but the biggest controversy was about whether uh, people using platform services such as Uber are considered uh, employees of the company called Uber, or self-employed workers who are using these platform companies to exchange and deliver services. Uh, it matters because if they are employees, they are protected under labor law that was already existent. And if it doesn't, uh, they basically don't have the protections that were negotiated before. Um, so that, that is the, the main discussion. Most of the discussion was about the, the employment status of people who use these platforms to, to gain money. Um, what is also good to, to realize is that it is very difficult to, to regulate these uh, platform companies because of their structure, because of their business model. Uh, in a lot of nations in Europe there are already uh, legal actions being taken, um, but because it is a multinational company, uh, they try to take it on an EU level to also make all the legislation consistent so it doesn't depend so much per country. Um, so a EU directive, which was the, the purpose or the incentive of the Commission, uh, would define the status for, for all people employed by yeah, workers, is a <laughs> difficult term here, but all people using platform services to, to employ themselves. Um, so what is at stake? In 2021, 28 million people used platform services to, to gain money in the EU, but this number is growing a lot, so by estimation in 2025, would be about uh, 43 million people using these platform services. And on the other side of this power struggle is uh, the, the platform companies uh, getting money from this business model. Uh, I put two really big uh, examples that I think we all know, Uber and Deliveroo. But what I think is, is good to remind is that there's a lot of capital being invested by other companies. So for example, Uber, uh, it's, it's funded by Amazon, uh, uh, Google, Nestle, Mattel, and Amazon is also funding Deliveroo. So there is basically a lot of capital behind the uh, names that we already know, and they're all somehow connected to each other. So what, uh, I will go specifically into Uber's defense, because the, the report mostly, I mean, they are like an example. <laughs> uh, so what is their side of this story, basically? So the, we know the EU side, uh, they want to protect workers who don't. Yes. Yes. Um, why is Saudi Arabia invested? Because they also uh, invested in. So that's the, those are the investors. Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to let yeah to show that it's not just this company, but also companies who invested in this business model that are affected by the decisions that the EU makes. Um, so Uber presents a, a bunch of different arguments uh, to support why uh, the people working through the platform should not be considered uh, uh, employees and why uh, they should be not regulated as normal employees. The first one is a famous one, which is that regulation would uh, result in job losses. Uh, then they make the arguments that platform workers actually benefit from better working conditions. Uh, so that, for example, pay is higher, is an argument that is made. And uh, a third one that they focused on a lot is that platform workers uh, prefer the flexibility of freelancing uh, that they don't get in, in regular employment contracts. And this narrative, it looks really innocent, or not innocent, but it looks pretty blank on, on a slide like this. But I think it's good to remember that it is reiterated through all these different channels. 
uh, which I would really recommend reading the report because it's, it's very well detailed. Uh, but we, I can highlight a few just to understand what happened. And I think it's, it's good to, to imagine you're a lobbyist and try to think of all the things that you would, <laughs> would do if you had that interest, which is uh, they reached out to uh, representatives uh, directly, but they also, uh, as we just uh, uh, discussed as well, uh, tried to find these think tanks to publish studies which uh, yeah, reported in, in their favor, basically, because a lot of the numbers about wages, for example, are very difficult to get because the data is in the hands of the corporations themselves. So the, it's really a, a power struggle on numbers as well. So it, it makes sense to, to try to publish favorable studies. Um, but also they employed a lot of consultants to identify targets in the EU who could be swayed one side or the other. Um, they hired uh, staff members. I don't think anybody else is from the Netherlands here, but there is a, was a very big scandal with someone who used to work in our government. I would love to talk about that if anyone <laughs> wants to do that. Um, this is also an interesting one, which is that uh, at some point recognizing that there is a need for regulation, but then proposing your own ethical system to do that so that the real need for legal regulation is not necessary. So you, prevent, like, you prevent actual sanctions. Um, and then this is a very sad one, which is basically to de legitimize all the stories of people who don't agree with you and, and try to not include them in the debate. Um, and that's basically why it matters, because all these, I all these pressures from outside, um, they present a real democratic debate about the pros and cons of legislation. And uh, for example, we were wondering, like, after a while uh, preparing this presentation, like let's say that it is true that workers miss flexibility and they want more flexible labor contracts. We, we are now not considering uh, if it's possible to, to come up with a, re a regular labor contract that includes more, more flexibility. The, the conversation is really determined by uh, the people who know how to play the system. And, uh, and this is the argument that the report makes that this is the problem. Um, it, is, uh, it also gives some hope, so don't <laughs> get super depressed because uh, there were examples of counterpower, which we'll, we'll discuss later. So, now we come to the discussion where we will try to look at a document that uh, we read uh, um, more critically. And we are as well going to add some questions to start and, and guide with the further discussion. So first, uh, if we looked at the document, it's really well written, and if we look at the sources, we see that it's mainly using uh, public information, so that's information disclosed by Uber itself, or by the Uber files, so the leaked documents, or uh, about the meetings of people of the uh, commission and their uh, cabinet. Um, but this is interesting, so this makes it really uh, robust, I would say, like it's difficult to dispute, because it's really factual. Um, but this may have um, as a consequence that we don't really see this, the scale of the lobbying. Um, so for example, these are like the, this is from the same site and was as well in the report as we saw earlier, uh, the transparency register. Uh, there we see that Uber has an annual budget of 700,000 to 800,000 uh, euro. What is what you could say like for such a big question as self-employed or employed, it's really the core of the business, so it's really rather small. And you can as well think like lobbying is as well for having better uh, tax benefits and so on. So then the number is is really rather small. So you see that there is like it's the use of this public information that Uber is disclosing themselves, but it could be that this number is too low. So this raises uh, the question: How you see the choice of um, the of being more cautious with like only using public information but as well showing the full picture. Then uh, as a second point, if we look at the context, the, the report uh, is commissioned by the <coughs> in the European Parliament, what is a fraction in the European Parliament um, that is wanting to influence as well the debate or wanting to back their argument. So this raises as well questions of how you see the, the role of the NGO, uh, like uh, Obsessoire de Multinationales, 
um, and your role as a researcher, are you just making it transparent by doing your research or are you as well spreading it or are you as well going to actively start lobbying as a researcher to spread the word or to influence there? Um, so returning the discussion to um, lobbying itself and how it works, and you have mentioned a lot already, so I won't go too much into detail. Um, but pretty important, um, yeah, we've heard it a lot, is the reliance on external expertise that was obvious from the beginning of the EU, and also the complexity of power distribution and channel, which is very specific to the EU, as you already said um, there. Um, it's a highly technocratic structure. Because of that complexity, there are numerous um, points of interference, so to say, in which you could influence the, de the decision-making process, um, especially in comparison to a more uh, straightforward lawmaking process. And also, this was already mentioned already, there is no European civil, civil public space as such, so um, no common language, uh, no common newspaper, so to say, and that makes it very, um, it, it makes it more difficult that everybody in the EU g engages with these topics. Um, similarly um, as with local politics, so to say. And the implications, um, we have also heard a lot of that already. Um, and we have heard that there is no universal law of access towards the EU lawmaking. Also the academic literature um, identifies that as well and has different approaches. Um, the first mm -hmm. is the, um, that the lobbying success is um, related to the triple I. Um, so that would be interest issues and institutions and the um, First means the internal unity of institutions and the degree of counter lobbying. Um, the issue issue relates to um, to which degree these issues are politicized already. Um, it's also pretty cl pretty clear from your um, from your speech already. Um, and also the natural disposition of legislation favoring some um, some parties over others or some positions that can also change over time, of course. Um, similarly. Um, Another scholar uh, that defines salience uh, um, and voters' interests as determinants for lobbying success, but that is, like I think, in my opinion or in our opinion, also another way just to phrase interest issues and institutions. <laughs> Similar as the degree of conflict, which also um, relates to salience um, um, to a high degree. And similarly, another interesting point is that the salience, the success is dependent <coughs> on salience, but uh, the, it is then again dependent on the coalitions between interest groups, we again have heard that already as well, so if Uber and Bolt are, um, work together, they have a way higher chance of success and they, it seems like everybody is united, so to say. If a small business tries to influence, even if they have a lot of money, it becomes more apparent that they're only um, doing it for uh, their own interest, to, so to say. Um, so um, also um, for the outcomes, this means there is mixed evidence for corporate versus citizen uh, groups' interests. Um, yeah, because there's just no single mechanism, and you can't derive any like causal channel. And uh, all the scholars you mentioned it as well. There's no black and white, and, and many scholars make clear that it's no big mid big business gets what it uh, wants. Um, but it's like uh, this. Yeah, this doesn't neglect the fact that they still have a lot of power to influence the policy making and you can still derive um, like the tendency that, for example, trade unions like influential power compared to corporate interests. Um, yeah, so that raises the question, um, so if you were, is the story of corporate interests dominate EU lawmaking or is this case a success story for a counter movement? I think you've answered it partly, but we really know you would do that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um. So then the possible strategies to, to counter this, so what, what could the future, how can we change it? And for, it's actually more, it's going to be a discussion that we have, so we want to introduce it by giving these three options. So the first one is where we would restrict the access to EU decision making. So examples of this is the revolving door restrictions and as well the execution, so if someone is not following the rules that they get uh, fined or jailed or something like this. Uh, the prohibition of indisclosed con uh, contact and then a more uh, creative one, the, the whistleblower protection. So if people come out and reveal things that they get protected. Uh, but of these kind of uh, policies, you get a uh, disadvantage that there is actually a need for this expertise of companies. So there can become uh, a lack. And can as well be that because of restricting 
the, um, the contact that they are not allowed to have, that they will move into a sphere where we actually don't know that this is happening. Um, yeah, another point, like at the other end of the spectrum, would be strengthening union representation, and especially for the case uh, for Yugo, we, we know that social partners have difficulties to adapt to the challenges of platform work, and in a similar way that Uber drivers uh, uh, like have a hard time to unionize because they're just so spread across, and also the flexible flexibility undermines the protection from um, unions. So. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, we thought um, one strategy might thus be strengthening the representation or strengthening the unions, uh, generally speaking. And we have no step-by-step -step plan, but of course there's a point to be made as a counter lobby towards um, those corporate interests. And lastly, I don't think we have a lot of time to go into this, but there are, I think, proposals of uh, structural innovations to the EU lawmaking system. Um, one that I've worked on in the past is called Citizen Assemblies, which tries to make a space inside a governmental structure where uh, regular citizens can uh, check or, or even contribute to lawmaking. Uh, and sometimes they are institutionalized. So for example, there's a municipality in Belgium where uh, next to a, a politician chamber and a senatorial chamber, you also have a chamber of citizens who can act as a sort of uh, control or yeah, at least a space where we could try to keep the lobby out. Um, the question is whether that is possible, whether it's possible to keep the lobby out of these kind of spaces. Um, but yeah, we would really like uh, your opinion on that and also the opinions of the class. Um, so the discussion question that we had for this is we would like to think together about which kind of strategies we would consider uh, the most effective to, to somehow check the power of the corporate lobby uh, inside the European Union. Um, we put all the questions together in one slide, so <laughs> um, thank you for listening. <laughs> I think it's better we sit down again. No? You, can, you can come back and yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I never answer those questions. So yeah, just so to be clear, it's really important. Uh, it's, it's great that you mentioned it. So you ha you read one report that I wrote, the latest one. Um, before that, it's the only one that I've been written writing on the uh, political party money. It's because before that, I was uh, working for on the preparation of the French presidency of the council, and we got two reports out, and most of the time. It's very hard to know the work that there is behind the report. It's the same thing like um, if you go to a show, or you, it's hard to imagine how many staff work for whole long behind the show. Same thing with a report. So I worked for a year and a half on the preparation of the council presidency when it was France. And I realized that France was very close to the platform uh, uh, workers. Like It was really obvious that France was the voice of Huber in the council. And then the Huber files went out. So at that time, I had loads of documents. I had loads of... Uh, exchanges between platform workers and the commission. Mm -hmm. And then um, Leila Shabi came to us and we had written an article independently and I had a document and she said, well, I actually have money if you could help us with a report. So yeah, uh, it's, the thing is, and it's often a question that I ask myself and my boss because we sometimes think should we put ourselves in the transparency register. Mm -hmm. Once that uh, report was out, I didn't do any lobbying with it. And when I meet decision makers, it's always high sources. I go and get, try to get information from them, but I never tell them you should vote this and check that amendment. So that's the, f the line that we have, and that's why we're not in the transparency register. And if you want to see how we finance it, it's on our website. Um, I think who bears a responsibility for the analysis? Um, to me, it would be both uh, European national decision makers, but also yeah, the ombudsman, but she, I, I know sometimes she reads what we write, but um, it's to me it's more collective because sometimes we feel we put the responsibility too much on NGOs uh, for actually you know, denouncing, but I think um, yeah, the European Parliament, national parliament should also use this as you know, 
um, even more ambition, let's say, to have more transparency. Um, we think of role most are uh, exposing, but again, we're not the ones advocating. So you have organization like Transparency International, the level that, that does this kind of, of job. Um, you also have MEPs that really try to improve transparency. So you have a former Transparency International, uh, who's now an MEP, who's trying to get a European inter-institutional ethics body, so to have, more, to have a body that makes sure the rules are respected with more powers. So I would say it's also the role of decision makers to improve their own ways of, of doing. And pro the problem with the EU is that they often you know, blame the others. So in the parliament, they will tell you, well, you're more transparent than the council, and the council is doing more transparent than the commission, and then inside the hot potato. So it's interesting that this time they're trying to have an inter-institutional, so have the same rules for the three institutions. Um, Uber is a very interesting case because uh, the competence of the EU, so by competence it's uh, when, so trade for instance is an EU competence. Belgium can have a trade deal with Guatemala, it's now the EU, right? Um, a lot of the competence of the EU are far away from EU citizens, right? So your salary, your working condition, your pension, uh, your hospitals, your schools, it's still national. But the trade, the finance, the chemicals is at the EU level. In a way, you could say that you know finance is not that far away from your school and, and university. The reasons why we don't have enough money for schools and uh, hospitals is also because of financial decisions at the EU level. But it's much harder to explain. Why am I saying this? Because Huber is a bit different. Huber is one case where you actually have a social policy that everybody can see the link every day when you take a Uber taxi or when you see someone in the rain delivering uh, pizza or whatever. So in this case, it's a case of an EU policy that has a daily illustration in Europeans' daily life. So the link between the European citizens and the policy makers is more direct. So I think that's also why it's in a way it's a success story. And I'm saying this because when I used to work on trade and against trade agreements, and we felt that we were raising people's interest when we were linking the very technical things to people's daily life. So we've, we've used a lot of past uh, cases in the World Trade Organization between the EU and the US, chlorinated chicken, GMOs, and things like this. And we said, well, actually, you know, those are the kind of things that are being discussed today about whether or not we're going to eat chlorinated chicken. And that's how you got people's attention. It has disadvantages because obviously it oversimplifies something that is much more complex. But it's a great way of getting people's interest. The problem is often you get people's interest, but do you get them deeper than the coronated chicken? That's obviously another, another question. I'll just finish on this. So, but there's other things in Uber. Not only there was a direct link between the Brussels discussions and your daily life, but there was also a lot of members of European Parliament that use it, in this case also Lady Lashabi with others, to get also political attention to their role. And they did things which are interesting, like Leila invited a lot of drivers and, and coursiers and cleaners to Uber or vote own lobbying uh, event inside the parliament. Mm -hmm. And I think this was really interesting because there were, in a way, it's, it burst that bubble. You know? They were not ready for this. They clearly didn't want them there. So they clearly didn't want to debate. And that's where I think it's interesting. It's like, how do you burst that bubble and you create a debate? And you create controversies and you accept it. To give you another example, it's, it's not to flatter my ego, but once I was invited to do a political debate with the Commissioner for Trade from Sweden by the Swedish National TV. And she refused. She said it's, it's me or her. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to debate with me and she cancelled. And it's like, if you are a commissioner paid by public money, the, you know, commissioned by Sweden to become commissioner for trade, and you're not able to have a debate with someone who disagrees with you on Swedish national TV, then there's a real problem. And it's the same thing when you bring drivers to a Yebebe. Yeah, you are doing politics. It is going to be controversial. And you, it's part of your job. So that's why I was saying it. And then there was someone raised their hands and yeah. Um, I think you partly now answered it, but maybe that's even more to it. Uh, my question was when you said you were simplifying things to start people's interest, like what 
um, modes of communication do you actually use? How, who are the people you talk them to? If you say you oversimplify or you simplify to make them um, interact with it, like what kind of channels are there? Well, a lot of it goes through, so at that time I was more a campaigner when I was working in the corporate Europe Observatory. At that time I used lots of uh, videos, uh, social medias, that's also what the MVPs do when they try the presentation, or they have events, they talk to the media, and things like this. So it's more trying to get it, it's trying to get attention for for the public, to the public, and for that public opinion to actually raise, mm -hmm. rather than going to the institution. And it goes back also to the question you were saying: What roles do NGOs play? Either NGOs talk to the public and they try to inform the European public. It's quite small, but you inform the European public. On EU policy, and you're trying to put pressure for people, or you focus on the institution and you just advocate the institutions and you forget about the public. And maybe that's where I would disagree with others, and it's a strategic choice that some did and others don't. Is that I believe that an NGO should have both sides. And maybe we oversimplify, but if no one else tries to explain EU politics, then you, you know, in my opinion, you have uh, it's part of your job. And sometimes a lot of NGOs, because it's such an expert job, end up only talking to the institutions and not always, you know, try to explain also and, and inform the um, public. My question is a little bit linked to that. How would you like compare um, lobbying, like the one that you just described, to uh, demonstrations or even like acts of civil disobedience? Like, how much do commissioners or like different types of policymakers? Uh, like how how important is that kind of public like pressure or like public opinion for them? Do they even care? Like what's what's your gut feeling about that? Well, it's the same feeling when you were saying before that uh, the coalition of interest groups. So um, we, I mean, when you have a lot of different organisations together, not only European uh, organisations but also national. And a lot of strategies together, I think that's where you gain. So I think, again, I'll, I'll talk about what I know best, but um, on TTIP we were strong because, yeah, there were demonstrations in Germany, there were civil action disputes in Belgium, in France, and there were, there were choirs in Slovenia, but there were also experts in the trade expert group of the Commission. There were people linking it to what it means for public health services, what it means for climate, what it means for agriculture. And so we were, we had experts talking in institutions, we had civil disobedience, we had petition. So in a way, in terms of themes and in terms of ways of action, a lot of the public found their way. They, they, could, they could follow the issue that they cared for and they could do something they think is more appropriate. So we were giving a, a, a different actions for the public to lobby in different ways so the demonstration is a lobby to the European institutions. Do they care? Yeah, on trade they start caring and they start being super scared. Um, I know that the environment commissioner went to one of the Fridays for Future demonstrations and it did give me him more influence when he was trying to get environmental legislation through. So of course they, they listen and they care, but then there's a yeah, it's, 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 it's not the only ways of influence, right? But it does have an impact, they do. Like, it's not by chance that uh, Ursula von der Leyen started about the Green Deal, you know. There is, when they can feel the pressure, they just don't like it, but they can feel it. <laughs> yeah. I have a very turbulent question. So the, the presenters, they had something that there's mixed evidence about the effectiveness of lobbying uh, and counter movements and what is not. So I think that is a, um, it's a quantitative question, right, which is more, mm. more of the time what is more successful. So I'm also trying to understand what exactly do you call lobbying? Is it called lobbying only when it is a corporate player with um, shady consulting firms and law firms that uh, are intransparent? But also a union can also hire consulting firms. So I'm because I don't know the context very well because I in my country trade unions also 
function basically as grassroots arms of political parties. So I'm trying to understand how it is here and what you call lobbying and what is not lobbying and again, yeah, what is more quantitatively speaking on aggregate strategy is successful. Um, so yeah, I would, lobbying I included also NGOs and trade unions and um, I include also public authorities and corporations, so I include everyone. The shady law firms and communications, they're not that shady, but they sh they aren't transparent, but they are like, uh, see, the Austin is a huge law firm across the world, and they really respect it, so. Um, how to be successful? Well, I would say it really depends. Um, if you have a lot of corporate, if you have most of the corporate world united behind the same message or the same strategy, it gives them more force, obviously. If you don't have a lot of counter power and it's not politicized, yeah, they're going to get stronger. Uh, but again, this can all change its politics. It's, it, there's a lot of different factors and things can change. Another um, a good example would be glyphosate. So glyphosate in seven years, so nine years ago, it was found carcinogenic by the World Health Organization. Uh, so it became a bit controversial. The European Health Organization said it's not carcinogenic. And a vote was happening in comitology. So comitology, it's all the member states together, and they had to renew glyphosate for 15 years. It was all going to be, you know, fine, no problem, 15 years, no debate. And then it became a huge thing. And no one really knows why it became a huge thing. Obviously, NGOs were against it, but it became a huge thing. And all of a sudden, it was going to be renewed for five years. All of a sudden, people doing comitology were going on the news. I mean, it never happened before. And it only was approved again for five years uh, because the Ministry of Agriculture of Germany didn't follow Merkel's advice. So I think here it's like, how do you know that all of a sudden uh, public mobilization works. It works until the point that it was nearly not renewed, but the power of the German chemical industry was bigger than the order from Merkel. You know, every issue is, is different. It's very hard to have like an idea of when or when it doesn't work. You see trends, but otherwise it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's politics. It's very hard to predict. Um, I wondered, because we talked a lot uh, about transparency beforehand, and you um, gave the example of the US, who has stricter rules in terms of reporting. Mm -hmm. um, but I wondered, from my impression of how politics is made in the EU and how it's made in the US, there is not too much difference in the outcomes, mm -hmm. or at least I would even, as a European, say it's maybe in terms of climate uh, policies a little bit better even uh, in the European Union. So my question is, does it change anything to make this report stricter about how policies is made and how, yeah, the rules of the game are? Yeah, it's. Um, I can share it because. You've seen my in my presentation. It was one of the things that I didn't go through. Is like is transparency the solution? Um, but yeah, you'll see it. I can send the link, and you'll see it. Um, maybe with a comparison with the U.S., one of big difference is that U.S. members of the Congress have to get corporate funding in order to get elected. I mean, in order to do a campaign to get elected. So that makes a huge difference in terms of influence. EU decision makers. But EU members of the European Parliament, most of them, not all, don't have to raise their own funds or go to corporations. So it does make a difference. In the US, it, it's true, it's more transparent. And you see a lot in the EU some public relations companies that actually advocate for more transparency. So some law firms will say, we want better transparency rules. And in, in a way, it plays for them because it means they get a better image. And it also means that Sidley Austin cannot sell to their clients, we better than them because uh, we don't disclose our clients. So it's also to do a level playing thing for their own business interest that they ask for transparency. So it's true that transparency in itself doesn't solve the, uh, the issue. It's funny because I told you about the council, how they're not transparent. And there's an academic study where 
since the agendas and some points of discussion, so it's only the agenda, I'm not what France and Poland and Estonia said, it's the, the issue they're discussing. Since it's more transparent, the coffee breaks and the dinner <laughs> breaks are longer in the agenda. <laughs> so that you, know, you can keep some informality. Um, so yeah, transparency can have, uh, it's, not, it's not a silver bullet, clearly. And I think that's why yeah, that article, I hope you can dig in deep a bit, and it's really interesting from what the ombudsman is saying. Yes, rules, transparency will be better, but it's the whole culture. Like, I think you also need to change the way decision makers are recruited. The whole ways of working have to be changed. And I think you need also more scandals. And because why do scandals matter? Scandals matter because they change rules, but scandals matter because the institutions are scared. Like, the Qatar gate, but the parliament is trying to improve because they don't want to tarnish the, the image of the parliament. But also it was a former president of the commission who went to work for Goldman Sachs. One of the first organizations to start a petition against this was the staff members of the commission. Mm -hmm. They were saying, we shouldn't let this happen because this discredited all her work. So, um, yeah. Rules, uh, more transparency, but more, yeah, more scandals. And I think, yeah, at the end, what I was saying again, more politics. If you have this transparency, but nobody is using it, it's a shame. If you have this transparency and you have more media, more journalists actually saying, hang on a minute, why do MEPs have two, three, four jobs at the European level when it's not allowed at the national level? Things like this, where you actually, transparency, yes, but being used in a political way to improve the institutions and not in a public relations way to improve the image of the lobbyists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was all you have to do. Just a quick um, reply, considering what my colleagues said about the environmental outcomes in the EU and the environmental outcomes in America, I really think that's a very unfair comparison because also the public opinion regarding environmental issues in the EU and America is fairly different. Uh, it's important to distinguish a uh, very uh, conscious effort, almost propaganda effort on part of the EU to try and make it seem as much more, uh, much less corrupt than America, when in the end it is very, uh, very, very similar, if not, if not worse. Um, I want to go into like the, the solution and like the idea of for economic decisions to <coughs> like the citizen assembly and that one to I mean um, I think uh, it's what I mean, you were saying, citizen assembly yes, but there will still need some expertise, so where do you get the expertise from? It's the idea of having multiple experts of different I mean, whoever yeah. wants to be an expert can come and present so you have a discussion among them. But I would say what I would say yes, but only if they will they have like a initiative power. Because I think it's one of the problems of the parliament where the, the the law that we were looking at on platform workers is one of the only few examples where it's the parliament that has asked the commission to do something on platform workers. And most of the time, it's the Commission that initiates legislation. So not on its own, it's through the pressure of the Council and the Parliament. But if you have a citizen assembly, or just the Parliament that we have now, and they can't initiate, I think it's, that makes it, um, yeah, it's, it's really the power of initiation. Because if, if the Commission sets the agenda, then you're more likely to have a decolonized debate. Well, if you have politicians setting the agenda, politicians being elected and wanting to be re-elected, you'll get a very different agenda. Because MEPs, it, uh, they want to get re-elected. So there'll be some, maybe some of them will be very proud to say, I make sure that Uber drivers get a contract, and then they can get re-elected on this, and then we can have a proper campaign also. Because the problem that we're going to have with the European elections is that they might come on TV, on French TV, Estonian TV, or German TV, but they'll talk about German politics. They're not actually going to say, this is what happens in the EU, this is what I've done. Where if you have an initiation at the parliament, the politicians will come at the national level and say, this is what I did in the EU. So all of a sudden, we're discussing real EU politics, mm -hmm. and not just EU politicians trying to get re-elected, speaking about national politics. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I have a two-question question. Like, do you consider that, for instance, like, that it's quite common that big, big uh, economic 
groups like have our shares or make contributions to media and newspapers, do that that is considered like lobbying because at the end like media and they can have like influence in the debates and public opinion and also for example they usually have like consultancy corporations that actually you hire them and you say okay rather than research about this I want to prove this but then at the end it's like the, the same like democratic opinion that shapes the debate so do you think that those the kind of activities are considered lobbying lobbying at all or is it something Again, it's never that black and white, but um, there are there's only there's really one big media at the EU level, and already that's a problem. <laughs> I mean, obviously there's Euractiv, there's Euronews, and things like this, but in reality, to be frank, most lobbyists and even people in NGOs, you read political newspaper newsletter every morning. Why? Because political is the only newspaper that you receive at 8 a.m. in your mailbox. And at 9.30 when your boss arrives, you know everything and you can discuss blah, blah, blah about the latest because you've read the news center. And that's what everybody does. And the political newspaper is on trade, is on pesticides, on agri and environment and finance. It comes every morning at 9 and everybody reads it. Political is sponsored by a lot of different organizations. Google, the pesticides lobby, Meta, government, whatever. Ernest Young, PCW. It doesn't mean that they won't have an investigative journalist looking into the shadow lobbying of Google. So it's not always that direct. But the problem is, it's the only time. To me, what's more, the first problem to me first is the only one. It's the only source of information. So again, you don't have conferences. You don't have different points of view. You have one sole, considered technocratic wave of so you're still in that same model that, that raises a lot of questions. And then if they receive only 1% from Google, 1% maybe, but still, I think there need to be diversity. And yeah, and then I never really know. The problem with political is also opinion pieces. So maybe the journalists are working on trade, doesn't get any influence from the EU-US Chamber of Commerce. But the EU-US Chamber of Commerce is allowed to do an op-ed on the trade deal. India, through Albert and Geiger, does a lot of open on your active opinion pieces about the EU-India uh, trade agreement. And it's uh, sponsored by Albert and Geiger, but behind Albert and Geiger you have the Indian government. So um, I think it's not just about, I mean, it's very hard, it's very great, to, and it's very hard to, with, to have evidence about how it influences. To me, the most important is you need more diversity of views, more public funding, and you need to regulate more opinion pieces. Because an opinion piece in political is almost 15,000. And you know, <laughs> it's not fair to have to pay to be able to speak. Um, did I answer all the questions that there were here also? Any other? More or less? Last ah, question. you have a, yeah. Do you think Rakai may become a lobbyist in the future? You said maybe you don't know about her, but she was the vice president of the European Commission. The parliament. She, the parliament. Oh, the parliament. And she, she spent some time in jail uh, last summer because, I mean, she said wonderful things about Qatar, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and unfortunately, they found uh, 200,000 euros or something like that, like that in the car and the car and, uh, at home and uh, I mean, yeah, just uh, lots of money. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's a corruption scandal, but... Uh, <laughs> but is, is it a kind of lobbying that may be derived into corruption, or...? Yeah. I mean, you know, the Cayman Islands, Morocco, India, they have their own lobbying strategy through uh, Kazakhstan. Not long ago, there was a great event in the parliament about Kazakhstan saying how great they are with human rights. Yeah. With uh, SND and EPS. I mean, foreign influence is there, obviously. Uh, this one is the worst case for the yeah. Vice President of the Vice President of the But what's really funny is that's an insider thing, but I have a friend who's an advisor of an SND MEP, and the day they had a, a the, so all the socialist MEPs were in a huge uh, amphitheater, and they were discussing Qatar, and he said that, that the difference were crazy, like there were Danish and Swedish MEPs saying, Oh, we can't let this happen, we have to change the whole system, I'm going to resign if we don't change the rules. And the Spanish were like, 
it's okay. Well, you know, yeah, okay, I voted for Qatar, but I didn't know anything about it. It's Eva Talon, and I didn't find it as a problem. So, I mean, there's a, yeah, again, there's a lot of different cultural ways of seeing it. But um, what I want to say also is that there was uh, someone in the commission, um, Heidi Holston, who was head of DG Move and who was negotiating the uh, pair traffic deals with Qatar, who went 12 times to Qatar also. And he was not fired, but now he's like, like he's got a very low level uh, job in DG, DG partnership or whatever. And he has been replaced, but it was also happening with the commission. And foreign trips are something that a lot of MEPs do. And it's really funny, there's a figure in Transparency International, when you see the number of foreign trips that are declared by MEP, and then after the Qatar gate, it goes like this. <laughs> and it's not just Qatar, it's Norway, it's Ukraine before the war, you, United Arab Emirates. It's, it was common practice for foreign governments to lobby. It's uncommon for them to have corruption. But also one last thing is, you need to think that it's, it's the Belgian secret services with some people in the parliament that raise concerns to a Belgian judge. It's not an easy judge that made this happen. There's no EU judge for this. And so it means that if you are, an, if you come out of the College of Europe, you're an assistant and an MEP, and you realize that there's loads of cash going around, and you don't speak French or Dutch, there's no way for you to go um, to a judge and say, help me, I think my MEP is being corrupted. And so it also raises those questions, you know, and it, it was a Belgian judge with the Belgian secret services. So there's a lot of geopolitical things involved, you know. And, and we really are lacking the means to have those corruption scandals out of the at the EU level. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so we start again at 4.30, sharp. Thank you.